Thank you, Danny. Good morning. Good morning. Sometimes I think we get so caught up in our projects and our technology that it's easy to forget that at the end of whatever it is we're designing is a person. And it's a person who obviously has a brain, and it's a person who sees, and a person who hears. And I think our topic today for the conference is so exciting. I have a PhD in psychology, and so I'm thrilled to be speaking on a venue where we're going to concentrate on psychology and design. And I'm going to kick us off with talking about vision, hearing, and the brain. Those are the things I'm going to concentrate on. So I've put together, um, I picked 10 of my favorite things, uh, 10 of my favorite pieces of research or concepts about how we see, how we hear, and how our brain is involved. And I'm going to go through those 10 with you. And I'm going to start with number 10 and move down to number 1. And that's what we're going to do this morning. So the first thing that I want to talk about has to do with the fact that our, our brain is really running the show when we talk about seeing and hearing. So if you look at that picture, which any of you who uh, studied psychology in school might recognize this picture. And you know, what do you see when you look at the picture? You see uh, a black triangle that's pointing up, and then you see probably a white triangle that's pointing down, right? Is that what most of you see? But actually, you know, there's no white triangle pointing down, right? There's just blank space. There's actually just those little black circles with pieces cut out of them. But your brain puts that white triangle in. Right? So a lot of what we see, there's another example. You see a white square. But there is no white square. There's just four partial black circles. A lot of what we see, we're not actually seeing. You know, your eyes are saying, oh, that's what I'm looking at. But it's actually your brain that's saying, that's what you're looking at. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about in this morning in, in this first hour actually has to do with the brain as much as it has to do with our eyes and our ears. Um, how we interpret what we see, for instance, on a screen, depends on so many factors. That, and you guys know this, like color and spacing. But you may not realize how very much subtle cues can talk to the brain about how to interpret what it's seeing. So just by putting something in a color, or putting more space between these two things and less space between those two things over there. You can imply a lot. You can actually get people to pay attention and interpret in a certain way. So the number, uh, the first thing, which is number 10, that I'm going to say is that our senses perceive, but it's our brain that is attending and interpreting. And we'll see a lot as we go through the rest of my other nine items um, that this question of the difference between seeing and paying attention and interpreting, that's a really critical difference. Next one I want to talk about um, has to do with the, uh, something called the fusiform facial area, FFA. Uh, and this will be on the final. No, that's a joke. There is no final. We're not in school. OK. So there's a special part of the brain that's dedicated to processing faces, primarily human faces. But it's actually pretty sensitive to anything that kind of looks like a face. So if it kind of looks like it has two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, the brain will start to pay attention. And this part of the brain, it's interesting. You know, The visual cortex in the brain, if, if you look at how the brain is mapped out, each of our five senses has a certain certain portions of the brain that are kind of dedicated to that sense. And the visual cortex for our vision is the largest of those. There's more space dedicated to processing visual information than any of your other senses. But the fusiform facial area isn't even in that visual cortex. Interestingly, it's in the middle of the brain, a part of the brain um, called the midbrain or the emotional brain, also I call it, uh, deep in the middle of the brain. This is the part of the brain that processes social, emotional information. And the FFA is in that part. It's actually right next to uh, something called the amygdala, which is definitely where emotions are processed. So there's a special part of the brain. And its job is to, A, recognize that it's looking at a face, B, 
decide whether it's a face that it knows. Is this someone I know? And C, also interpret the emotional feeling of that person's face. And because of it, it means that we're really sensitive to faces. And faces will grab our attention. If you have a face at a website, it is going to grab attention because of the FFA is looking out for a face. Now, there's two things, you, a couple of things, two primarily that you want to do when you're deciding what kind of face do I, do, you know, do I want to use a face and what kind and how should it be looking. You, I'm sure you've all read, you know, you should have the face looking at the product, picture of the product on the page. Well, indeed, if you want the, the, the visitor to your website, for instance, to look at the product, you do want to make the face looking at the product. We will tend to look wherever the person's face is looking. But that's, that's not the biggest impact of faces. So a bigger impact of faces is to have the face looking right out at you, because that's going to be the biggest emotional impact of the face. Uh, by the way, I want to mention that if the people who have autism, um, there, there's a connection between the amygdala and the fusiform facial area. And people who have autism don't have that connection. There's something wrong with the connection. So for most people who don't have autism, when they see a face, they can read the emotion. They can see whether someone looks surprised or angry or sad or happy. Because the amygdala, where social information is processed, is attached to this fusiform facial area. There's a, there's a connection. But in people with autism, that connection is broken. That's why they can look at a face. They know that it's someone they know or don't know, but they can't read. They actually have to practice um, learning uh, groups of muscles. You know, when the eyebrows are go, <clears throat> go up and the, the muscles are you know, tensed, then that means the person's angry. If the eyebrows go up and the mouth is all that round, then that means the person's surprised. I mean, they actually have to memorize these things that other people who don't have autism don't have to memorize. And that's because of that connection. All right, so let's take a look at some pictures. And I just picked a collection of websites, a lot of them um, being universities, because I like to pick on them. I don't know why. Uh, and I think these are all probably from the United States, where I am from. And this is University of Wisconsin. I am from the state of Wisconsin. And my son actually went to the school. And it was interesting, you know, for, for a long time, the, the, if there were pictures of students, and there weren't very many, they were looking down, and they were studying very hard. And at the time, University of Wisconsin was rated the number one party school in America. And I, my guess was they were trying to combat that with these pictures of very serious looking people. Uh, so, you know, everyone is very, very serious. We're serious here. Uh, this is University of Minnesota, and, you know, some kind of a building in the distance and one, apparently there aren't very many people that go to this school, you know, we have one person, you know, no, so no emotional impact because they're not looking right at you. Uh, I don't know what, you know, the person in, uh, yes, yeah, stalker, someone said, yes, that's what we have. This, this university has lots of stalkers. Um, this is uh, from a medical website um, here in Britain. And he, so here's a case, this is interesting, where one person is looking out at you and the other person is looking at her. So you're going to ten, kind of take in the scene, but then you, 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 know, you look at her because the other person is. Although I don't, you know, and so the, another option is to have, instead of people looking right out at you or people looking at a product, you can have people looking at each other because there's a story going on. So that activates a whole other part of the brain that we're actually not going to talk too much about this morning that I do in some of my other talks, which is about stories, which are very powerful. Although here, you know, I'm not sure... I'm actually not sure what the story is. I wondered if, you know, they're kind of out in the garden, so like, are they picking herbs that you're going to get, you know, as part of the healing process? I don't know. It doesn't really make much sense. So you really want to obviously think about the context of, of the photo. Now here we have another university one, and she is kind of looking right out at you. She also looks very happy. So you think, well, that must be a good place to go to school. Uh, these guys, I don't know, a squirrel. Why they would choose a squirrel, I don't know. But notice he is looking right out at you, okay? Very good emotional appeal on that one, okay. Uh, and then finally they did put some people, same school, they put some people in their, in their pictures. So we know then that the, that the human face, very, very important, captures attention, gets emotional appeal. Don't do this, okay? I don't know what this, I think they were trying to make a statement about you know, diversity or we have, I don't know. But 
the fusiform facial area looks at this and it goes, creepy, <laughs> get me out of here, I don't like it, right? So don't do that. I'll leave it up there so you, can, you know this one down here, that's even more disturbing, <laughs> you know? No, all right, we'll take it away, I don't want to creep you guys out. All right, so that was uh, number nine, the fusiform facial area. All right, I have another one now. And this one I'm going to actually um, have you guys um, do a little memory test for you. I'm going to show you a photo. And your job is to look at the photo and try to remember everything you can about it. I'm only going to show it for maybe about five seconds. So study it as much as you can. All right? So here's the photo. OK, so now I made the photo go away. Now I'm going to show you the photo again. I'm going to tell you that there's been one change from the first photo to the second. And I want you to see if you can figure out what is different about the second photo. Now, if you do figure it out, don't shout it out, all right? Because we want to see how many people catch it. So just silently note it to yourself, and then we'll talk about it in a minute. So here's the second photo with something missing. OK, what do you think? What's missing? Jet engine is gone. So how many of you caught that? OK, and the rest of you did not. So uh, just to go back to prove that there really was a jet engine, there's the jet engine, and now the jet engine is gone, right? Um, some of you were probably looking to see, you know, if is that hat blue or something like that, right? So this brings up a really interesting um, idea in psychology that's called change blindness or inattention blindness that you, um, you have probably heard of. And I've got um, actually a couple different, I have uh, a, a video I want to show you of this, which uh, another example of it that I think is, uh, you may have seen this video, or maybe not. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing colour-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, OK, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. OK. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck. But she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers, and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour changing card trick. Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing colour-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, OK, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. OK. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck. But she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers, and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that 
is the amazing colour changing card trick. Did you catch them all? I didn't the first time I watched it. I didn't catch any of them the first time I watched it. So what happens is we know that especially um, two, two, uh, time, two different situations this will happen. If we're distracted, right, which is what's going on here, because the camera's zooming in and out, and you know, we're kind of focused on the card trick, and so we're distracted, we don't notice what changes. That's one thing. Or if there's a blankness in our visual field, which is what I did with the photo and the jet engine. Uh, if you see, if, if you see uh, one view, and then there's a blankness, and then you see another view, it's really easy for, for you to miss things, even if you're not distracted. Um, and in fact, our you know, blinking right, <laughs> makes a blank view. Um, so this is why it's so, so common for people to think they have seen something and they haven't, or to uh, miss seeing something altogether. And I know, um, uh, I may not even show you this one. We'll see, uh, you know, how many of you have, um, have seen the uh, famous basketball video that shows this. Yeah, many of you have, and some of you have not. So I won't show you this one, but you might want to, um, if you haven't seen it, go to the, uh, uh, look for uh, selective attention test and go and watch. It's called the gorilla video, right? Because uh, as people are playing basketball, a gorilla walks through and nobody sees that either. All right, so inattention blindness. Um, which actually, um, before I go move on to this one, I just want to mention, you know, what, why is this important to design? It's so, it's so common, for instance, that we refresh a screen. Uh, someone has fill, is filling in a form, and they press submit to send the form that they have filled in online, and we refresh the screen, and on the refresh, we tell them there is an error, right? Because they filled something in wrong. And they don't see that error message, right? And you know, they call up the help desk, and, you, and the person says, but you know, is there an error on the screen? I don't know. Well, it's right there in front of you in red letters. You know, why aren't you seeing it? And that's a great example of the screen changing a little bit. It's still the same screen. And so actually, I've, I've often watched in, in usability testing, which I, you guys probably have too, you've watched someone like just keep pressing the submit button, wondering why is this not submitting? Why am I not going on to the, you know, a new screen? It's because they don't realize that there's been an error. So this kind of thing happens a lot, all the time when people are online. All right, I want to talk about this one. Um, another study, which has to do with peripheral and central vision. So I want to talk about the role of peripheral vision and central vision. So Larson and Lashke, they were curious, what, you know, really, what is the role of peripheral vision versus central vision? So first, let me just explain terms. So if I look straight out at this you know, poor man sitting here, because and now I'm going to stare at him, but that's OK. If I look at him, that's my central vision. I see him in central vision. Now, if the rest of the room, you guys like wave your hands and arms around for me. Yeah, and I can see you perfectly doing that. That's my peripheral vision, right? So central vision what you're looking at, peripheral vision, the rest of your visual field. So Larson and Lashke asked, what's the difference? And what they did was they, w they took pictures of rooms, and they purposely made them kind of gray. I mean, you can see them, but they're not crystal clear. And they did that on purpose. These are actually some of the pictures they used. And they took pictures of rooms, bedrooms and kitchens and living rooms. And sometimes they would make the center part visible and gray out the periphery. And sometimes they would make the periphery visible and gray out the center. And they had a very controlled um, uh, size, et cetera, so that when people looked at the screen, unlike this where you're seeing you know, the whole screen and words and other things, you know, this entire thing would take up your whole visual field during the experiment. And their question was, which way would people recognize the rooms faster and more accurately? when the central vision was showing and the periphery of the room was grayed out or vice versa. And they were a little surprised to find out that people recognized the room more quickly and more accurately when the central part was grayed out and the periphery was visible. And that's not what they expected. And what they have theorized is that we use our peripheral vision to get the, what, what they call the gist of the scene. So we use our, when, when we're walking around, when we walk into a room, or when we're looking at a picture, we, our peripheral vision more quickly 
tells us, oh, here's what you're looking at. Oh, here's what's going on. And our central vision we use for details, but it's the periphery. And I think we underestimate how important peripheral vision is, especially, for instance, on screens and, and on websites. So this is number seven. People use peripheral vision to get the gist. So we do, you know, a lot of times these days we see uh, uh, web pages, for instance, where there isn't anything in a lot of the peripheral vision. And I know, you know, this might be done for a variety of reasons so that we can uh, flex the size of the screen so that it can more easily become a responsive design or, you know, who knows all the different reasons that people might do this. But we are really wasting that space. If people are using peripheral vision to decide, oh, I am on the page I want to be on or, oh, I, I want to stay here. Another thing we know about peripheral vision is that um, uh, pictures of danger or any strong, um, uh, possibly fearful situation are processed faster in peripheral vision as well. So our peripheral vision will be sending us information. Uh, for, so for instance, this page is actually uh, probably pretty effective in grabbing and holding attention. These peripheral areas, they're very kind of vague and you can't really tell what it is, but it looks a little, little scary, a little fearful. That's probably going to grab attention and keep someone on that page a little bit longer than otherwise. So think about how you are using the peripheral vision on your pages. Understand that that information is probably being processed unconsciously. That's another point I want to bring up right now. Um, as you're sitting there and listening to me talk and watching the slides behind me, the estimate is that there are 40 billion, 40 billion sensory inputs coming into your brain every second. 40 billion. That's coming from the things you're seeing, the things you're hearing, uh, the taste of tea or coffee that you still have in your mouth, all your nerve endings as you're sitting in the chair. 40 billion sensory inputs every second, but you are only consciously aware of, at most, 40. 40. So what's happening to all the rest of those billions and billions of sensory inputs? Are they not being processed? No, they're being processed, but they're being processed unconsciously. So one of the things we have to start to understand as we talk about psychology and design is that a lot of what's going on and a lot of the things you're going to hear the rest of today are all things that happen unconsciously, which creates a real um, uh, interesting dilemma or paradox for those of us who do design. Because we're having to design for unconscious mental processing. And, and actually, because it is unconscious, it's also very hard to test. So if you ask people, you know, were you, uh, were, did, the, did the images on the, uh, in your peripheral vision <laughs> grab you and affect you, they're going to look at you and go, what? What are you asking me, right? Or even worse, they'll make up an answer, you know? They'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, or no, 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 I ignored it, right? We, we uh, don't like the idea that there's all this stuff going on that we don't know about, and so we just make up answers. Uh, and we actually believe those answers are accurate and true. But as researchers, we have to understand that there's, you know, 95 percent or more of all the thought processes, all the decision processing that's going on is unconscious. And if we ask people, they will give us an answer, and it is probably not the correct answer. Now, I want to say a word or two about this whole idea of central versus peripheral vision and eye tracking. So how many of you um, uh, have ever either done an eye tracking or seen results of an eye tracking test? So most of you know what I'm talking about. These are, you know, it's a special piece of equipment. You can, it's either a special computer to monitor or special glasses that people wear that track uh, where they are looking. And then people use that data to decide, you know, did someone notice something on the screen? Are they paying attention to this particular image? So, um, I'm, I'm a real popular person at eye tracking conferences, not. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because I have criticisms 
of eye tracking. I think you have to be really careful. First of all, what is eye tracking measuring? Is it measuring central vision or peripheral vision? Central vision, right? So it's not measuring peripheral vision at all. So we can say that when someone looked at this particular screen, you know, their central vision went right to here. And it might very well because it's actually a face, right? But we don't, but the fact that they looked here does not mean that they did not register what was going on in peripheral vision. It doesn't measure it at all. And we know that it has an impact. There's another reason I'm critical of eye tracking, and that's because just because we, someone is looking at something doesn't mean they paid attention to it. I mean, I, this I call the refrigerator effect. Okay, how many of you have ever opened up the refrigerator and said, where's the ketchup? Can't find the ketchup. And your spouse or your roommate comes behind you and says, you are looking right at it. And you go, oh, oh, there it is. And you were. Now, if you had been wearing eye-tracking glasses, it would have shown that you were looking right at the ketchup. So you looked at it, and you saw it, but you weren't paying attention to it. We cannot assume that just because someone looked at something and their eyes were gazing at it, that their brain paid attention at all. And that's one of the problems I have with eye tracking. So you got to be very careful. Certainly you can say that people's, their, their central vision was looking at that image. But that's pretty much all you can say. And I get kind of perturbed when people then start making decisions about the web page design and, well, let's get rid of this. No one looked at it. And, you know, and I say, yeah, but it was in peripheral vision. And they go, huh? You know? So uh, now you can also be a very popular person. Uh, with your eye tracking people, you can go and tell, talk to them about this. All right, number six. So um, this is a different one. This is uh, one I find kind of interesting. So this is some research by Greg Stevens. And what he found was that, well, he, okay, he would put people in an fMRI machine, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And this looks at um, the pattern of brain activity. And he'd put people in the machine and have them uh, listen to uh, a recording of someone talking. And he would put um, either a recording or he'd have someone talking at the, simultaneously, which was the speaker, in another fMRI machine, and he would record their pattern. And what he found was that when people are listening to someone talk, uh, the, the brain activity patterns sync up. Right? So as I'm talking to you right now, if we, if, we looked at, if we could look at my brain activity and look at your brain activity, we'd find that whatever activity pattern I have, you have about um, you know, a millisecond or two after I do. So we actually, when people listen to someone talk, their brain syncs up. And um, that doesn't happen when you read something I wrote you know, two weeks ago. Right? So it means that uh, audio and video is really powerful. Actually, one of the most powerful things about video is the audio, is the sound. We pick up on so much stuff when we talk. So I can, you know, if I wrote the sentence, um, I'm so glad you came to the conference, and I wrote that, and you read it at a website, you don't know, uh, there's a lot of information missing. In, 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 if I said instead, I am so happy that you came to the conference. Right? That conveys a lot of information through my voice. Or I could say, I'm so happy you came to the conference. Right? That conveys totally different information. Written on a page, it all looks the same. And a lot of that is my voice, is the inflection and the tone of my voice. Now, if you combine that with the video, Right? And if I go, I am so happy you came to the conference, right? Or I'm so happy you came to the conference. Uh, you can also get cues not just from my voice, but from my facial expression and my gestures. So audio and video really convey a richness of information that text alone cannot. Another thing that makes video so powerful is this idea of peripheral vision. Because in, I mean, there are some really bad videos 
where someone is just standing there and talking and they're not moving at all. And in that case, there isn't much movement going on in peripheral vision. But in most videos that you see online, I mean, even like that card trick one, there's things going on and there's movement. And we know that, remember, the peripheral vision, um, we're, we're kind of, our brain is kind of clued in. And, and one thing we know is that when there's movement in peripheral vision, that makes us pay attention. That's because years and years ago, evolutionarily speaking, the, uh, the people that noticed that a lion was coming at them from the side were the ones who lived and passed on their genes. Right? And so we are very sensitive to this idea of movement. And when we see a video, there is movement. And that's going to continue to keep grabbing our attention. So I'm a big fan of having audio and video online and using that as part of our presentation um, because we know it will grab attention and, uh, and because of this brain sinking from the speaking. OK. Now, next thing I want to talk about, I want to go back to the brain, which I just can't seem to leave alone. And I want to talk about something called System 1 and System 2 thinking. How many of you have read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow? Has anyone read that? Yeah, a couple, several of you have. Great. You know, I, I applaud this audience for uh, so many people having read that book. Um, I can tell you that I go to some conferences, uh, and I ask that question, and it's like nobody's heard of it or one person has read it. It's a great book, a little, little dense, a little hard to read, but a wonderful book. And in there, Daniel Kahneman talks about this idea of system one and system two thinking. And uh, I'll give you some examples. So if I ask you to multiply 17 times 24 in your head, not using pen and paper, so go ahead and try it. OK, I'll stop torturing you. You can stop now. Um, that's an example of system two thinking. You know, I gave a talk in London a couple of days ago. And this guy in the front seat like yelled out the answer right away. I was like, OK, you know. <laughs> is he showing off? Or does he have some weird brain wiring or what? And I just smiled and said, oh, that's wonderful, right? Uh, and I don't even know if it was the right answer, because I don't even know the answer to this. Don't shout it out if you know. All right. So that's an example of system two thinking. System two thinking is effortful. You've got to concentrate. You have to focus, right? As opposed to this. If I show you this picture, and I say, what, is the, what are you looking at? What's this a picture of? What would you say? The sad boy, right? That's an example of system one thinking. It's quick, it's intuitive, it's not hard at all, right? So system one thinking, quick and intuitive. System two thinking, effortful and, and focused and concentrated. So what Kahneman says is that most of the time, when we just walk around in our lives, we are actually in system one mode. We are walking around making quick, intuitive judgments. We're not thinking very hard. We don't like to think very hard. Right? It takes too much glucose too much effort. Our brains don't like to do it. So actually, most of the time, we happily wander around in system one mode. This creates some interesting uh, dynamics, uh, some interesting um, possible confusions. And I'm going to talk to you about them uh, in a moment. But first, I want to mention something else that Daniel Kahneman found out, which is that when people are doing that system two effortful thinking, their pupils dilate. You can actually tell when someone is in system two mode by looking at their pupils. So I have a short video I'm going to run. And let me tell you a little bit about the video before I run it. Um, the audio, you, you'll, you'll be able to hear this person talking very clearly. But uh, there's me and one other person that, that's asking her questions. And our volume is not quite as high as hers. Uh, this was done kind of on the spur of the moment. And I didn't have great uh, audio equipment. So what I've done is I've put down here what it is I'm saying. right? So what I do is, the first I'm going to ask her a system one question. That's the easy, intuitive, right? I'm going to ask her to talk about her favorite TV show. That's not hard. So she talks about that for a while. Then I ask her a system two question. And what I ask her, actually, is I ask her to name the states in the United States, because she's from the US, the states and their capitals, OK? Which is a pretty tough. That's a system two. And I want you to watch her eyes as I do that. You'll see them dilate. It's very subtle, but you'll see them dilate. And then, I'm, and then I go back to a system one question. I ask her what her favorite animal is. All right? So let's take a look and see. So tell us about um, one of your favorite TV shows.
And they're really cute. Okay. So did you see it? It was subtle, but it was there. One thing, I don't know if you noticed, but when she was doing the capitals, there was a point when her pupils constrict, constricted again. That was when she had given up. Daniel Kahneman used to, he would do these experiments uh, and he'd have a big video camera outside the room. So he was actually outside the room and having the people do this on their own. And he would talk to them in a microphone. And he'd give them, you know, system two tasks to do. And then he would see their pupils constrict again and he'd go, you've given up, don't give up. And they'd go, oh God, how did he know that? <laughs> yeah, he's in my brain. Right? All right, so I thought we should try this out. Should we try this out with each other? So um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring up the house lights. And, uh, I'm going to explain this all to you before I let you loose to do it. Because with a group this size, when, when, I, when you start, it's going to get really noisy in here, and I'm not going to be able to talk to you for a while. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to find a partner to work with. So you're going to work in, in pairs. And you're going to take turns. So decide who's going to ask the questions first. And you're going to think up, think up a system. You want to start with a system. One question, that, which one is that? That's the easy one. So think up a system one question. I mean, just you know, ask them about the apartment they live in or you know, something where they went to college, just something easy that won't be hard for them to talk about. And then you're going to think up a system two. Let them do that for a minute and look at their, uh, the pupils. And then you're going to think up a system two question. That's the hard one. I mean, ask them to multiply numbers together or ask them for you know, what countries are in the United Nations, or, you know, just something difficult. And look and see if you can see their pupils dilate. It'll be subtle, but you may be able to see it. And then you can go back to a system, two, uh, system one question if you want, so you can see the pupils constrict again, all right? Then when you do that, then you're going to switch, right? And then the other person will ask the questions. Now, a few things to tell you. First of all, if you're the one who's talking and answering the questions, the tendency is when you answer questions, to move your head around and you go like this and you look up and you look down. And it's really hard for the person to see your pupils when you're doing that. So try not to. Try to be like the, the, the woman in the video was just like, you know, stand still. It'll feel a little weird because you're just like talking without looking around like you usually do. But you can do it. It won't be too hard. All right? Um, if, when I say go, you don't have a partner to work with, then what I want you to do is stand up. Okay? And then you look around, and anyone else standing up, guess what? They don't have a partner either, and that's how you find each other. All right? So you're going to get a partner. If you don't have a partner, you're going to stand up. You're going to decide who goes first. You're going to do system one question first, then system two, then back to system one, and then you're going to switch. The whole thing takes about a minute, and when I need to get you back, because it's going to get really noisy in here, okay? I'm going to do this. When you hear the drums beating, then, you know, try and quiet down. All right, uh, do we have uh, lights? There we go, lights up. Begin. How many of you could see the people? Yeah, some of you good. good. It's subtle, but you can see it. Now, I do have to tell you that um, there's one of the reasons why your pupils might dilate like that, and that's if you're attracted to someone. So I'm not saying, I'm not commenting on that, but you'll have to figure that out by yourself. All right. So uh, system one and system two thinking. So for instance, Daniel Kahneman would give people this paragraph. 
In a lake, there is a patch of lily pads. Every day, the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half of the lake? How many of you say 24 days? And how many of you say 47? Right. And the right answer is 47. A lot of people, if you just come up to them on the street and ask them this question, they actually get it wrong. Interestingly, when he would put the paragraph in a font that was hard to read, exactly the same thing, a lot more people got it right. Hmm. They got it right when the font was hard to read. You know, why would that be? Well, it's because uh, this problem requires system two thinking. And as I said, we walk around every day and our normal mode of thinking is system one. So we read the paragraph, we go, oh, yeah, yeah, half of 48 is 24, I'm going to say 24. When the font is difficult to read, what essentially happens is system one goes, I don't know, I can't see what's going on, <laughs> and turns to system two and say, you do this. This is too hard. I don't want to do this anymore. Right? So we can actually kick in system two thinking by making something difficult to read, which, of course, is why I'm going to say that at any website you're designing, all the fonts should be hard to read. No, 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 no. I can't say that. So it's a, but it's an interesting problem. And certainly, if you need people to make difficult, logical decisions that they think through, you're going to have to figure out some way to try and kick them into system two thinking, because the normal mode will be system one. All right. Um, so that leads us to number five, which is when something is hard to read, our system two thinking is activated. All right. A little more about fonts, et cetera, since we're talking about vision. This was an interesting study done, done by Song and Schwartz. And what they did was they took two instructions. This has, these are physical therapy instructions. They actually did this at a clinic. And um, they would give pe the people had neck exercises they had to do because they had problems with their neck. And so sometimes they would give the, the instructions uh, in a very simple, easy to read font. And sometimes they would give them in a difficult, kind of decorative, overly decorative font. And what they found, they asked people uh, two questions. One was they asked them, how long do you think it'll take to do this exercise? And the people who, and then they actually measured to see how, uh, how often people did the exercise uh, later on. So what they found was when, they, when it was an easy to read font, people said they thought it would take on average eight minutes to do. And when it was in a hard to read font, they said they thought it would take 15 minutes to do. It actually, you know, the amount of time it takes doesn't, doesn't matter with the font, but they thought it was going to be a lot harder to do, almost take almost twice as long. And actually what they found was that people were more likely to do it, of course, when the font was easy to read because they didn't think it was going to be such a big deal. Oh, this will only take me eight minutes. That's not a big deal. I guess I can do it. So we know, and there's the, the reference by Song and Schwartz, we know that if things are, are hard to read, then people think whatever it is you're talking about in that font is also hard to do, kind of an interesting uh, add-on that we add to that. So hard to read equals hard to do. All right, so that's number four. Now, for the next one, I want to talk a little bit about um, Ivan Pavlov. And again, those of you who studied psychology might remember that name. So Ivan Pavlov was a Russian biologist. He actually was not a psychologist. He studied digestion. He studied salivation. And, um, I bet that when you woke up this morning and came to the conference, you did not think you were going to, you were going to hear someone talk about dog salivation. Right? That's probably not what you thought was on the agenda. But I'm going to talk about dog salivation. So Ivan Pavlov would measure. He'd give these dogs. He had dogs. He would give them a piece of meat. And he was measuring the saliva production. I mean, I don't know why. No one had measured how much dogs produce saliva. But he wanted to know that. It was actually part of. Um, he was studying the whole digestive process. And um, then what he found was that uh, they would start to salivate before they even ate the meat. And this, at the time, was news. I mean, I think we kind of all are aware now that when we see food, and if food is on a plate, you know, we start to salivate. But that hadn't really been thought about then. So he was kind of interested. That's interesting. They see the meat, and they start to salivate. But then it went even further, because when the people who took care of the dogs came to feed the dogs, they, would, they were wearing these boots. I mean, this was Russia. It was winter. They had on big, heavy boots. And they found that when the dogs heard the boots, 
they would start to salivate. So he, um, Pavlov was the first, you've probably heard the term Pavlovian conditioning. He was the first one to actually identify this idea that there's a stimulus and there's a response. There's meat and then there's saliva. And if you pair the meat with something else, like the stomp of the boots or a bell ringing, because he also tried it with a bell over the door, you, can, you will actually then uh, get to the point where just the sound of the bell or just the sound of the boots will produce the response. What could this possibly have to do <laughs> with design? Well, actually, um, this kind of conditioned automatic response happens all the time. And it happens with, well, how many of you have set your cell phones that when you get a text message, it goes ding or some other noise, right? Uh, or when you get a text message, it's one noise. When you get uh, a voicemail message, it's another noise. Um, when you have a reminder, it's another noise, right? So these, these are conditioned responses. And I'm willing to bet that you've also had the situation where when you hear somebody else's phone ding, it's not even your own phone. It's not even your ding. Okay? But then you reach into your pocket and look at yours, right? That very conditioned response. And it's interesting, because what we know about this type of conditioned response is that they're especially powerful. Uh, they can be auditory or visual, by the way. It doesn't matter, either one or both. Uh, and it's especially powerful when they are unpredictable, when you don't know when it's going to come, which is true right, of text messages uh, and voicemail. And so we, you can actually condition someone. Now, this can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. And in fact, uh, we also know that this is related to dopamine in the brain. There's a neurotransmitter called dopamine. That, and, and the role of dopamine, some people think that dopamine is like the pleasure chemical, like, you know, it's, it has to do with uh, eating sweets and having sex, et cetera. And dopamine is involved in some of that. But actually, the latest research tells us that the role of dopamine is information seeking. We love information. And whenever we get information, it releases a little dopamine, which then makes us want to get more information and more information and more information. I mean, how many times have you gone online to do something on the internet? And 30 minutes later, you're still online, and you're not doing anything at all what you thought you were going to do, right? That's dopamine has probably been released. We also know that when we get these um, conditioned uh, stimuli, like the little ding or the little, you know, uh, you have a text message, that also releases dopamine. And you can get into this dopamine loop. And if you've ever read any of the, the um, advice about, for instance, how to, how to be more productive at work, uh, they'll often tell you things like, turn off your email alerts, right? So on your computer, you know, you can control if an email comes in, a little thing comes in, oh, you have an email, right? Or, or, or it shows how many email messages are there that you haven't looked at yet, right? That's all conditioned responses. That's all fueled by dopamine. And if you want to be able to focus on what you're doing and not get distracted, you actually have to turn those off because you've got a conditioned response. Now, on the other side of it, if you are designing something and you want people to become addicted to your application, um, then you want to think about using these, you know, these auditory or visual cues are going to create that conditioned response and create a, essentially a habit uh, and a dopamine release, and people will want to use it more and more. Okay? But I didn't tell you that. So you can't, your users can't blame me when you do that. All right, so number three is we become conditioned to especially unpredictable auditory and visual cues. All right, we have two more to go. This is just a little weird, quirky one I thought I'd throw in because I found out about it and I thought it was interesting. Um, a couple years ago, um, Amazon asked me to come in and give a talk on um, the uh, psychology of beauty. And I thought, OK. That's a little strange, but I can do that. So I did some research on uh, the latest stuff on, on uh, beauty. And I believe we have a talk today on neuroaesthetics, do we not? So that's, gonna, that, that's fascinating, fascinating stuff. But this is just one little thing I found when I was searching for my The Psychology of Beauty for Amazon. And that said people prefer objects with curves. Okay? 
so uh, this is a study that, you know, they would show people uh, watches with square faces versus round, you know, couches with square edges versus round, uh, abstract figures that had hard edges versus uh, not hard edges, and they also tested out um, uh, objects that had a lot of little spiky things. And what they found was that people had a preference for objects with curves. So um, I, I think that's, you know, I don't know if people are doing this on purpose, but it's partially why we'll see a lot of uh, devices, you know, iPhone, iPad, other devices that have just slightly rounded edges, because people will prefer those. Uh, so uh, people would, you know, just again, probably unconsciously prefer this device over this device because this one has square edges. And what you want to do is avoid something like this. Okay. That's an actual product. Uh, I'm, they're, you know, supposedly they're doing it because I think if you put the spiky things on when you drop it, it protects it. But, you know, people will not think that's beautiful. All right. And so we have one left, and for this one, I need some help from you guys on this one uh, to demonstrate something, and then we'll talk about it. So what I need, you may have noticed that I have, I mean, I used one of these drums, right? And I have other drums, I have a tambourine, I have various shaking devices. So I need... Uh, Seven volunteers, seven brave people. Uh, if, you've or, if you've always wanted to you know, play percussion in the band, this is your opportunity. If you've never played percussion, that's OK. So I need seven people to come up, and, and we're going to create a little percussion band and to help me demonstrate. So seven people can be from the, we'll wait. If you want to come down from the way back, we'll wait on you. All right, we have one. We have two. We have three. Coming down from the back. Four, five, six, seven. Oh, well, no, four. They, they were just getting up. Let's see. One, two, three, four. All right, we, I think we got it. Come on up. Excellent, excellent. We have steps right out here. So you guys uh, pick whatever you'd like to play. Different drums. We have a wood block thing. I left my cowbell at home. It was too heavy to bring on the, on the suitcase. Both, both is good, yeah. All right, one, two, three, four, five. You know, we're missing a person, aren't we? I need one more. Ah, here he comes, all right. Very good. So we'll wait for our seventh person here. You got two drums, a wood block, and a shaker to choose from here. What would you like? Shaker. Shaker, all right, line up here. So what I would like you guys to do is play. up there does play percussion. I'm going to get you, you may You may have a seat. Thank you very much for helping me out. So why did I make that? That was actually the best percussion band I've ever had on the stage. I got to say. Did we, I, hopefully we capture that on video. And it's going on YouTube. It's going viral. And our next stop is Manchester. Um, uh, why did I have them do that? Well, what, what did you, did you notice anything, by the way? 
the synchrony. So, and especially because there was one person who had experience and knew what they were doing, right? And uh, it was kind of interesting to watch because everyone else was like, oh, hey, <laughs> that sounds good. I'm going with that, you know? And then at first they were just kind of like, and then they were like, okay, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. And then it was like, can I do this, really? Can I really? Yeah, I can do this. So uh, they had a lot of confidence, uh, and they were, they were really following that leader. So w what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Well, our, my last point that I want to bring up is that um, we really can't separate vision and hearing from our social and emotional processing. Right? So uh, people have a deep desire to belong to a group. It's, it's in my book, uh, How to Get People to Do Stuff. It's one of the seven drivers of motivation that I talk about, is the need to belong. So, you know, I brought them up here. It's a little uncomfortable. You know, they're, they're, uh, you know, they've already volunteered, so they're trying to be a good sport. Now they're in this band, right? And they want to be part of the band. Uh, and they were so grateful that a leader took over. In fact, what's interesting is they, they were looking right out at you, I noticed. And I can tell you that sometimes when I do this and there isn't a strong leader, they are looking at each other, someone please, they're looking at me, please tell us what to do, right? But in this case, they didn't have to because they had that strong leader, they were part of a group. We know that when people do something in synchrony, when they drum like that, when they sing, when they dance, um, when they play in a band, uh, we know a couple things happen physiologically. First of all, oxytocin is released. And oxytocin is uh, a bonding chemical, and it will make the group bond. So actually, those seven people, if you see them at break all huddled together, <laughs> it's because they've, uh, they, they may not realize it, but they've had an oxytocin release together, and it's going to make them bond together. We also know, for instance, there's research study that when people sing together, their heartbeats start beating in uh, synchrony with each other. Right? So um, all of this, you know, we tend to think about, you know, we, we see and we hear and we have our senses and there's separate senses and that's, you know, a separate part of the brain than the social emotional part, but it's not, okay? We, we, you know, I'd like to talk about, oh, we have three brains, you know, the, the new brain where conscious thought is and the mid and emotional brain which um, processes social and emotional information, the old brain which takes care of our survival. I talk about that a lot, but in reality, you know, we have one brain and it's all interconnected. So when you are designing and when you're making decisions about what people are going to see and what people are going to hear and how that's going to affect the brain, understand that you, that person brings to bear all of themselves, including their social and emotional life as well. So those are my 10 favorite things about vision and hearing. I have a, a few ideas for you. Um, if you are interested in learning more about this, we've got a couple of, I have a couple of ideas. The social and emotional part and the, and the uh, motivation and persuasion is in this book. And then the other book that you might be interested in, if you're really interested in more about this, which is very specific vision and hearing, uh, all about the fonts and everything like that, that's in my 100 Things Every Designer Needs to Know About People. So those are the, the two books you might want to concentrate on. I also do have... Um, uh, online video courses, and this course right here, Design for Engagement, has a lot of what we've been talking about here. Um, and I want to leave you with a thought from Scott Adams. Uh, creativity is allowing yourself to make mistakes, and design is knowing which ones to keep. So I'm going to encourage you all to make lots and lots of mistakes, because I know that you're designers and you'll know which ones to keep. So I want to thank you very, very much today. Thank you. Have a great conference.